Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm going to give you an overview of why I think uh, the future demands some radical ag agriculture, first of all, and then a little bit about the C4 rice challenge. We all know the population's increasing, and these are the uh, UN numbers for that 2015 7.3 billion, 2050 9.7, and 2111.2 .2 billion. And we know this, but the reason I want to put this slide up here is to show you where that growth is going to occur, because that's going to be relevant to the sorts of things we're discussing later. So most of this growth is going to be in Africa, some in Asia, and Asia already has the majority of the population. Those of you who are saving the potato because of European population growth, actually Europe's going to decrease its population size over that time period. So Europe is declining uh, and Asia and Africa is where all the increases are going. So that's what we need to think about in terms of how are we going to feed the world in the future. Really it's how are we going to feed Africa and Asia. And so Back in 2009, the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization, did some predictions of how much grain we would need to produce by 2050. And their calculation said 3 billion tons. And this was based on each individual having a cal calorie intake of 3,000 calories a day. And they estimated how much of the world will be eating meat, and so how much would then be needed for cattle fe feed as well. Um, but they didn't incorporate biofuels into that. But they said 3 billion tonnes. And many of you will see, you might have even had lecturers tell you, that that means we've got to increase food production by 70% by 2050. That's not correct. That was correct in 2009. But actually, the grain harvest in 2015 was 2.5 billion tonnes. And that equates to just a 20% increase needed. And that's just 0.6% per annum, which is well within the sorts of increases we're getting from traditional breeding at the moment. So what's the problem? Is there a problem? Well, there's two problems. One is shown on this graph here. So what you're looking at here is this is global cereal supply, and you're looking at production in orange, and it's measured on the um, axis on the left. So the production of total global cereal supply and utilization in the dotted yellow line. And so you can see that for most years, production is above utilization. That's a good thing. However, the key thing here is on the right-hand scale, and these gray bars here are what the closing stocks are. And food security is defined by the FAA as having 30% of the annual harvest as a supply in stock. And you can see here, this is the 2017-18 forecast, the forecast would be to have about 750 million tonnes as, as stock, and that is not 30% of the harvest. And so we're already in food insecurity in terms of global cereal supply. So that's one thing to think about. And the other is that despite the fact that we've got all this food at the moment, is that there is still a prevalence of undernourishment in the population. And this is shown here that um, the so dark red is 35% and over of the population of that region are suffering from undernourishment. And in fact, in parts of Africa, that number is one in four individuals. But actually in Asia, because of the population size, there's a greater number of people in Asia that are undernourished. So we do have a problem and we do have to think about what it is that we can do to alleviate it. So one of the first things we can do is think about variable yield gaps. Plants are planted in the soil. Where and when do you actually get the potential yield fully realised? And so this is showing the data for that for maize and for rice. And wherever you see red, plants grown in that region are nutrient limited. Wherever you see blue, they're both nutrient and irrigation limited. And only in where you see green are 75% of the attainable yields reached. So you've got maize in the US, does fine, it gets loads of fertilizer put on it and gets irrigated. And same for rice in China. But pretty much everywhere else, there are nutrient and or water problems. So there are three essential inputs for all crops, water, phosphorus, and nitrogen. And we need to think going forward about 
where our main pinch points are with these imports in terms, inputs in terms of producing crops. So I want you to think for a second, and then I'm gonna ask for hands up to who thinks which of these is the main pinch point going forward. Who thinks water? Who thinks phosphorus? Who thinks nitrogen? There's a few of you who don't think, but yeah, the majority is nitrogen. In fact, nitrogen is the one where we don't have a problem. We have a problem of using too much and the nitrogen running off, but there's plenty of nitrogen in the atmosphere and the Haber process means we can convert that nitrogen into fertilizer for crops. So I'm not actually gonna talk about nitrogen, but I am gonna talk about water and phosphorus and just sort of point out the problems that we have coming up and how plant science may be able to do something about this. So the first is water. So this is a map, um, it's, I mean, this is from a number of years ago now, but it's quite hard to get these data. This is the most up-to-date one I can find. And what you're looking at here is global freshwater deficits. So we're looking at blue water, as it's called. So that's everything in aquifers, lakes, reservoirs, rivers. And anything above one, so anything yellow, orange, or red, water is being taken out of those reserves at a rate at which it's being evaporated or used up by everything that's taken out. So it's being depleted. So only those in green are safe in terms of not depleting their blue water reserves. And so you have large areas of Australia, South Africa, India, where water, groundwater supplies are being depleted at an alarming rate. And this is what happens in circumstances like that. This is from 2016, and this was a major drought in South Africa. And this was a cornfield, and you can see it doesn't look very happy. What do you think South Africa did to compensate for this catastrophe? Anybody? Go on. They imported their maize. And they imported the maize, and the only maize they could import of which there was sufficient supply was GM-modified maize. South Africa has a non-GM policy, but that went out the window as soon as they got hungry. They imported the food stocks. And when you import food, you import water, because 70% of fresh water is used in agriculture. And this just gives you a few examples. This is an American slide, hence the ounces and pounds. But you can see, 37 gallons of water for every cup of coffee. That's the amount of water needed for that plant to grow to produce that coffee. So when crops get moved around the world as food, then what you're doing is trading in water. And this graph here shows you the amount of water moving around. So the bigger the arrow, the more water is moving. So America is, North America is exporting huge amounts of water to Mexico in the form of maize and corn. And rice to Japan. So the green countries here are the exporters and the red countries are the importers. And notice what I said about Australia being one of these water deficit countries and yet it's exporting water in its crops. This is clearly not sustainable. Water is one of the very few commodities for which there's no price. Every other commodity that moves around the world there's a price in which it's traded globally. Water's not one of those commodities. So something is gonna to have to be done. And here's an example of plant science triumphing in this regard. So this is a line of rice that is grown in India, Sabagi, Sabagi Dan rice. And you can see quite clearly here, this is very drought stressed ground. And this plant, this particular variety of rice does very well. It has a very respectable harvest each year. And it's a solution. It's a solution that's been brought through by traditional crop breeding, but it took 40 years to make that one line, starting with a variety that was drought tolerant and then introgressing all the various traits needed to make it a reasonable food. So there are ways, but that's not a very quick way of doing it. Okay, what about phosphorus? So phosphorus is a very explosive element, so it's not in the atmosphere. In fact, it's all in rock. But of course, we know it's absolutely essential for life. It's in the backbone of our DNA. It's a major component of ATP, our energy provider, the cell's battery. So without phosphorus, there can be no life. 
So if we run out of phosphorus, we will run out of life. So let's look at the phosphorus cycle. It's in the rock, and it gets mined out through a very elaborate mining process. And you get phosphate fertilizer, it gets put on the land, the grain gets fed to animals, the animals and the grain gets fed to us. And in an ideal world, what should then happen is that everything that comes out of those animals, including us, should go back on the line, on the line, on the land. But it doesn't. In main cases, in most cases, it goes into water and it runs off of water, it runs off of farmland, and it goes into sewage treatment plants. And so our phosphorus cycle is broken. And so the world is running out of phosphate. And here's the data for 2015. This is the amount of phosphate extracted from rock in 2015. So 45% of the global supplies were extracted in China. Morocco did 13%, the United States did 12%. The US actually imported phosphate rock from Morocco for 25% of its supplies because it knows it's only got 25 years left of its own. So it's trying to tease out its own supplies for as long as it can by importing rock from Morocco to extract from. China has 135% export tax on any phosphate product going out of the country because it doesn't want it to leave the country. It makes the incentive to keep the phosphate in the country. So in 2015, 223 million tonnes were harvested, extracted from rock, and this is what's left in the world. 69 billion tonnes, and most of it's in Morocco and Western Sahara. There's a little bit in China, a little bit in Algeria, Syria, another. If you divide this number by this number, they've got 300 years max. So we need to do something about that. Otherwise, we run out of phosphate in 300 years, therefore we run out of life. So can we make plants better at actually taking up phosphate so we put less on the land? So this is just shows what happens to fertilizer phosphate when you put it on the ground. It goes into the ground and only 20% of it is readily available for plants to uptake. So essentially the roots have to touch the phosphate, otherwise it's not taken up. 80% of it becomes stable and fixed in the ground. And so one way that could perhaps be looked at is to look at things like white lupin, which have a very natural adaptation to growing in either high phosphate, when the roots just go down, there's plenty of phosphate around, or in low phosphate, when the root architecture changes and it starts scavenging, looking for more phosphate. And maybe it would be possible to alter root architecture in cereal crops, for example, to enable them to do that. But ultimately, and this is something for your generation to think about, you're going to have to come up with ways of putting phosphate back on the land instead of into the waters. So now, who thinks water's the biggest problem we've got going forward? And who thinks phosphate? I think phosphate. Water's going to be unpredictable, but it's still going to be there because you've got the cycle. It goes from the ground to the clouds, comes back down again. But it's unpredictable when it's going to come down. That's the problem. OK, right. So now I'm going to switch gear and say, let's assume we've got these inputs, at least for the next 300 years, and we can feed our plants with water and nutrient supplies. How then can we think about increasing the innate ability to produce grain or biomass. And this is where we think of the sun, thinking about harnessing the energy from the sun. So the yield equation is that yield equals the amount of solar energy times the amount of solar energy intercepted by the plant times the conversion efficiency in which that solar energy is converted to biochemical energy, so sugars, and the partitioning efficiency whereby those sugars are moved from the leaf into the grain or whatever else the crop is. So traditional breeding has thus far 
achieved what is thought to be 99% of the maximum interception efficiency. So that's all about whether or not the sun's coming down, are your leaves like this and intercepting all of the light that's coming down, or are they like this and most of the light's going down the sides? Canopy architecture is estimated to have been optimized as pretty much as much as you can. And the partitioning efficiency is estimated to be about 92% of optimal maximum efficiency. But here's the one where there's still lots of potential to make things better, and that's the conversion efficiency. Converting sunlight into sugars, and that is essentially photosynthesis. So why is photosynthesis so inefficient? So here is the basic Calvin cycle, C3 photosynthesis that hopefully you all learnt at school. Carbon dioxide is fixed by the enzyme Rubisco and it's fixed into a three carbon compound, three phosphoglycerate, hence C3 photosynthesis. And that three PGA is converted into carbohydrates and then the cycle continues. So that is basic photosynthesis. And the problem with it is, is that Rubisco is promiscuous. So in addition to taking in CO2 and converting it to two molecules of 3PGA, it will also react with oxygen. And when it reacts with oxygen, it produces one molecule of 3PGA and one molecule of something called 2-phosphoglycolate. And 2PG is toxic for the plant. So the plant therefore has to initiate a process called photorespiration which detoxifies this product. And that process of photorespiration uses energy. So part of the energy that's being generated by photosynthesis gets consumed again by photorespiration as a consequence of this product being made. So this is in effect counteracting the benefits of this. So C4 plants, evolved a way of overcoming this. And essentially, it was a two-pronged attack to keep oxygen away from Rubisco. So this is the C4 pathway. And the key feature of it is it's that the metabolic pathway is divided between two cells, which for now we'll call the outer cell and the inner cell. And in the outer cell, which is closest to the epidermis, where both CO2 and oxygen are present, CO2 and oxygen can enter, and CA is converted into, sorry, carbon dioxide is converted by carbonic anhydrase into hydrocarbonate, and that then gets fixed by this enzyme here, pepcarboxylase. And pepcarboxylase is blind to oxygen. It doesn't care how much oxygen is around. It is only going to fix CO2. And it fixes the CO2 into this four carbon compound oxaloacetate, hence C4 photosynthesis. The four carbon compound gets converted in the chloroplast to a different four carbon compound by another enzyme here. And then that four carbon compound moves into the inner cell. And in the inner cell, this malate is decarboxylated by another enzyme a decarboxylase called malic enzyme here, and that releases CO2 in the presence of Rubisco. So in a C4 plant, you have this exact same cycle going on, but only in this inner cell. So this Rubisco here never sees the oxygen in the from the environment, and when it does see CO2, it's at a much higher concentration because it's been shuttled in and the CO2 has been dumped at the site of Rubisco. And then that pyruvate goes back and completes the cycle. So in effect, by sequestering the Rubisco away from atmospheric oxygen, and also by concentrating the CO2 at the site of Rubisco, photorespiration does not occur in C4 plants. Now that pathway involved two different cell types and quite a few enzymes. I didn't even mention all of them. And yet that complexity evolved over 60 times. So what you're looking at here is essentially a tree of all the different flowering plant species. And everywhere you see a red line, there is a species that has evolved C4. So 
60 times, all in a period about 25 to 35 million years ago, and in diverse families. They're not all in the same family in this tree, they're dotted around the tree. So something enabled it to happen, despite its complexity, on multiple independent occasions. And what consequence did it have? Well, you get much better yield as a consequence of not having that photorespiration. So this is a field in the Philippines where rice is at the front and maize is at the back. Maize is the C4, rice is the C3. They were planted at the same time. You don't even have to look at the grain yield that comes from them. You can see just from the vegetative biomass that there's way more biomass being produced in the maize plants than the rice plants. Now, of course, you could say to me, well, that's nothing to do with C4 versus C3, that's just rice versus maize. But this, in the middle, is a weed. This has never been selected for biomass production, it's just a weed. But it's a C4 weed. And you can see that even that has way more biomass than the C3 plants. So, you get more yield, you get better radiation use efficiency. So, what you're looking at here is a graph of the standing dry weight at harvest versus the length of the growing season. And all of the circles are C3 plants and all of the triangles are C4 plants. And you can see quite clearly, I hope, is that the slope is much steeper for the C4 plants. So they can just keep taking that radiation. The growing season, the longer it is, the more biomass you'll get produced. So you've got better radiation use efficiency. They're better at using that sunlight. They've also got better nitrogen use efficiency, and what you're looking at here is leaf nitrogen content from increasing from left to right, and then the rate of CO2 assimilation. So at any point here, you're looking at the amount of CO2 fixed per, per amount of nitrogen in the leaf. The green ones here are the C3 plants, and the yellow ones are C4 plants. So again, for a similar amount of CO2 being fixed, let's just arbitrarily say, take this line across 40, then you need a lot more nitrogen to do that in a C3 plant than you do in a C4 plant. So, better nitrogen use efficiency. And finally, better water use efficiency. And this one is done, again, slightly differently. What you're looking at here is a, a, a genus of plants called Flavaria, in which there are species that carry out either C3 in dark green, intermediate C3, C4 in the lighter greens, or C4 in the yellow. So that's the type of photosynthesis. And then you're looking at the amount of CO2 fixed per mole of water. And so the higher the bars, the more CO2 you've got fixed per mole of water, so the better water use efficiency. And you can see quite clearly here that the the C4 plants have got double the water use efficiency of the C3 plants. So, put all that together, and theoretically, if you could convert a C3 plant to a C4 plant, you could increase yield by 50%, you could improve nitrogen use efficiency, so not need as much nitrogen fertilizer, and you could double water use efficiency. So even though it looks quite a complicated thing to do, why wouldn't you try? And that's where the C4 rice project started. Oh, my little flags have changed to letters. That, so far, that's the only thing that's gone wrong when we <laughs> transferred to the computer. <laughs> OK, so we started off in 2006 with a workshop in the Philippines uh, saying, getting a group of people together who worked had worked on C4 photosynthesis. Most of them were even older or even more senior, as Celia would say, than I am. And many were due to retire, and there really weren't many people left working on any form of photosynthesis because it was considered we knew everything. And it wasn't something that was getting funded very much across any of the funding agencies anywhere in the world. And we got together and we said, if we're going to do this, now is the time because the technology was advancing in a way where we could envisage being able to, so prior to that time, it wasn't very easy to transform rice to make transgenic plants. There was no way of getting high throughput sequence data until about 2005, 2006. So it seemed like everything was converging to say, let's try it. 
And we set out a plan that was five phases uh, ending in 2039. And we said, okay, we it would take us at least three years to start building a molecular toolkit of things we might need to actually engineer this pathway. Then it would take at least another four years to, to get some proof of concept that we might actually get this to work, et cetera, et cetera. So then the question is, well, who on earth is going to fund this? You're not going to get the BBSRC or any of the UK RI funding agencies funding this. So we went to Seattle and met the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and we convinced them that this should be their first agricultural Apollo project. At the time, they were invested in, in medical projects that had similar long-term uh, objectives, um, and they funded it. They funded it for the first three phases, and I have just last week submitted the proposal for phase four, which was invited by them. Um, so it's not for 10 years, but it's for five more years. Um, so we're optimistic that will get funded and we're carrying on. So the question is, why did we choose rice? We could have picked any C3 plant. We could have picked the barley you guys wanted to save. Why did we pick rice? Partly because it does feed most of Asia. It is Asia's lifeline, basically. Um, but also because it was just perceived that it was going to be easier to work with. And the bottom line was that in 2010, the numbers were suggesting that the number of people that were dependent on rice in Asia on a hectare of land was 27, and that number needed to increase to 43 by 2050, which happens to be a 50% increase, which happens to fit in with our theoretical predictions. So here we go. Let's do the project. What have we got to do? Well, we've got to take a C3 plant, we've got to change the leaf anatomy, we've got to change the whole biochemistry of the photosynthetic pathway, and then just do a bit of fine-tuning, and we're done. So, so let's just think about that a bit more carefully. So here's C3 photosynthesis, that single cell. Let's just think about what we've got to do just for the biochemistry. And when we started, I should say that the genes encoding the majority of the enzymes in the pathway were already identified. So we knew from maize what the genes were that we needed to be thinking about. But if you just look here, every enzyme that's surrounded by a blue box has to have its expression changed so that it's only switched on in one of the two cell types. So in a C3 plant, Rubisco is on everywhere. These other enzymes are on doing other housekeeping functions, but they're not on at high levels in specific cell types. So we have to modify that. Everywhere there's a blue circle is a transporter that isn't required in C3 photosynthesis. So you've got to get all of these transporters. And this was actually somewhere where something that when we started, we didn't actually know what two of these transporters even were. We did not know how pyruvate gets in and out of that chloroplast, for example. We do know. So we've got to change all of those genes in terms of their expression, both in terms of where they're expressed and how much of them are expressed. And then we've got to do this. So this is a rice leaf, schematic here. You have veins, which are quite wide apart, surrounded by what are called bundle sheath cells that have no chloroplasts in them, and then seven or eight mesophyll cells in between that are all carrying out that C3 photosynthesis. If you compare that with maize, you've got veins that are much closer together. All of the bundle sheath cells have big chloroplasts in them, and there's only two mesophyll cells between each vascular bundle. And that's because you need those two cell partners for the C4 pathway to function. You've got to have that outer and inner cell to get the pathway working. And when we started this project, we had absolutely no idea whatsoever how this pattern was brought about in maize, let alone how we might start engineering it in rice. So that's where we were back in 2008 when we started. By now you're probably thinking we're completely bonkers and why on earth would we have started on this project when it was so huge in terms of unknowns? And the answer to that question is we 
believed that because evolution had done it so many times independently, there had to be a way to do it that was easy. We just had to find that way out. And we haven't found it yet, but that, more, of, more of that later. We're still full of optimism. OK, so here's the project strategy. Because we knew the genes encoding the enzymes, so had, a, had a, an idea of how we might be able to engineer the metabolism, but we knew nothing about the leaf anatomy, we decided we had to do this in, in two, two parallel approaches. So one was to introduce the C4 metabolism into the existing rice leaf anatomy. So could we, just around the existing veins, get that two-cell shuttle going metabolically? And then in the second strand, we'd work on trying to understand how the leaf anatomy was regulated and how to modulate it. And then finally, we'd bring those two, chain, two things together. So let's just start by looking at this. What have we got to do to change that anatomy? So here's the, um, the rice leaf again. We've got to switch Rubisco plus three other genes on in this cell type. And we've got to switch Rubisco off in this cell type and switch seven different genes on. So we've got to modify at least 10 genes. Now, the rice group earlier mentioned um, golden rice and the vitamin A deficiency problem that was there. Two genes were modified in, gol in golden rice. And it's still 20 years, and it's not on anybody's table yet. So this is a huge challenge to modify 10. But we started. And we started by essentially putting individual genes in. You can take the seed from rice. You can generate callus, get that callus, introduce genes, regenerate the plants, and get seed back in five months. But when we started the project, you could only do this one gene at a time. So imagine this. Oh, sorry, just to say. And of course, we had, to do, we had to make sure we could get them on in the right place at the right time, because they needed to be on in one cell type, not the other. So here's an example. This is just using a, a reporter gene that shows blue. Here's a, a switch that we identified that allowed us to switch a gene on just in those outside mesophyll cells and not in the bundle sheath cells. And here's one that did the opposite. So these switches were critical. When we introduced the genes into the rice plant, we had to have them with the right promoter that would turn the gene on in the right place. So we started. Remember, we're aiming for about 10 genes. First generation, we get four different lines, gene one, gene two, gene three, gene four. Then we can start crossing them. In the second generation, we can cross gene one to gene two, and a quarter of the plants will have both of those genes. And in the third generation, we can cross that to that, and a 16th of the plant will have all four genes. So now imagine if we're getting up to 10. So at this point, technology advanced again as we were plodding on with this, trying to push as many genes stacks into the plants as possible. And technology came out that allowed us to start molecular pyramiding instead of pyramiding by crossing. And this is essentially, some of you may have heard of it as Golden Gate cloning or modular cloning, where you can essentially start with a library of molecular parts, so switches and enzymes, and you can assemble four or five different combinations in a single construct, and that can be inserted directly into, into even targeted sites in the genome, so that now you can get, with just one insertion, you can get five individual genes. So essentially what we did about three or four years ago, we took all those ones that we'd spent years making pyra by pyramiding by crossing, and we threw them all away, and we started again. We started again doing it this way, because if we can get five genes in one locus and then cross it to another line that's got another five genes in one locus, one in four will have our, four, will have our 10 genes in. So when we're going through this, we sort of reiterate and look at different combinations, and it's an ongoing project. Meanwhile, let's have a look about what we're doing with the leaf anatomy. I mentioned we knew nothing. So this is what we're trying to understand. How do you get wide vein spacing and a single cell type versus narrow vein spacing and two photosynthetic cell types? So it turns out that many, many years ago, I'd done some work that showed that in maize, the leaves that surround the ear of corn that you eat had an anatomy that looked more like a C3 leaf. 
So these leaves still did C4 photosynthesis around the veins that were there, but then they had lots of mesophyll cells in between. So this allowed us to use leaves in a single plant as proxy for C3 versus C4. And with the introduction of this high throughput sequencing that allowed us to sequence every single gene that was expressed or turned on in these leaves, we were able to, first of all, look at the different stages of development in the two leaf types. So here's a very early stage in a foliar leaf versus the husk leaf. And you can see they look pretty similar, just color coded the veins here in yellow and the bundle sheath cells in green. But by the time you get to this next stage, and this is really, we're talking here of going from about two millimeters tall to about four millimeters tall, this little leaf primordia, you can see that here, there's still that single vein that's getting bigger, whereas in the foliar leaf, you've started to insert these extra veins in. So the anatomy that's, um, the C4-like anatomy is starting to develop at this stage here, and by this later stage here, you can see this has now started to go vein, bundle sheath, mesophyll, mesophyll, bundle sheath, vein, that classic pattern of two between each, whereas this doesn't. So all we had to do at this point, all we had to do, one of the people in my lab dissected out about a thousand tiny, tiny leaf primordia for each of these stages, extracted RNA, and then we sequenced every single gene that was expressed at each stage in each leaf type. And what we were looking for is genes that came on just before this stage here, genes that were likely to be regulating this developmental transition. And they were predicted that they would not be turned on in these leaves here. So we started with 30,000 genes, and now we're sat at the computer. We're not in the lab anymore. And first of all, we looked for genes that were off in husk leaves and on in foliar leaves. Then we made sure that they were on at the right time in those foliar leaves. And that got us down to 283 genes, which was a ridiculous number to even contemplate doing anything in terms of functional analysis, but we were pretty pleased. There's 283 genes that we had at least a hope of looking at and having some idea of what might be going on. But then the next step, we spent about six months reading papers, thinking about everything that was known about those 283 genes, either in maize or any other species, trying to get an idea of what they might be doing. Are they transcription factors that switch on lots of downstream genes? Are they receptor kinase that's, that interact with peptides that communicate between cells? And with that, we whittled it down to 70 genes. And this, we thought, OK, this is a reasonable number. We can do some functional analysis here. So what we proposed to do was to say, right, let's take these genes and let's turn them off in maize and see if we can switch to a C3-like anatomy if they're turned on, off. Turn them on in rice and see if we can switch to a C4-like anatomy. Well, I have to say this was a total disaster, absolute disaster. There is no way you can use maize or indeed what is now considered the new model for C4 plants, Ceteria, in a high throughput push through 70 gene screen. It was crash and burn. So we didn't get anything from that. But we did get a lot of information from the rice experiments because what we'd done was we'd taken these genes and we'd put them downstream of a constitutive promoter. So something that was going to turn them on high levels right from the beginning of development. And 50 of them did absolutely nothing to the rice plant. So we reasoned that if if the genes we were looking for are involved in this quite precise uh, patterning of cell types in the leaf, we couldn't possibly turn them on at high level at all stages in development and see absolutely nothing happen. So those 50 we got rid of. So now we're down to 20. And now with those, we're doing more sophisticated experiments, turning them on at different times, turning them off at different times in different plants. And that is ongoing work. So we're now at the point where we think probably out of that 20, there's about 12 we're still looking at and working out which ones we might have to manipulate in rice. We're down to about 10 genes for the biochemical change. So this is still a huge endeavor. But 
we're an awful lot closer than we were 10 years ago because we know what genes we're trying to, to manipulate. So that's where the sort of original plan is. But I'm just going to, for the last couple of slides, give you an example how sometimes, if you think laterally, luck happens. <laughs> so I mentioned that C4 has evolved multiple times. What we decided to do was have a look at the anatomy of the transition from C3 to C4. And I mentioned in one of the earlier slides when I was talking about water use efficiency, how there are some families that have C3, C4 and intermediate type species. So we had a look at that, look at those families to try and work out the order in which different traits were acquired in the C3 to C4 transition. So there are two intermediate types, one's called protocrans and one's called C2. And I'll show you precisely how they differ in a minute. And so one of the things we noticed is that but by the time you got to protocrans species in the trajectory from C3 to C4, something had happened to those bundle sheath cells. They'd got wider and shorter. They hadn't increased in volume, but they changed shape. And then it wasn't until the transition from C2 to C4 that that vein spacing change happened. So that's probably the last thing. So, so that made us think, well, let's, let's not worry too much about the vein spacing at the moment. Let's see if we can get to the bottom of what's going on with these early transitions with changing shape of the bundle sheath cells. And if we look at the same time in those same stages of what's happening with the me metabolic pathway. So in the C3, we know that Photosynthesis and photorespiration is localized in the mesophyll cells. So the photorespiration, um, part of it's occurring in the mitochondria. So pinks mitochondria, greens chloroplast here. So you've got big chloroplasts and big mitochondria in the mesophyll cells of a C3 plant and basically just very tiny ones in the bundle sheath because they don't develop and they're not photosynthetic. In protocrans species, however, there is an enlargement of organelle volume in the bundle sheath cells. So the, cell shell, the cells have changed shape and the organelles, both chloroplasts and, bundle, and chloroplasts and mitochondria, have increased in size. The next step involved in the C2 plants, photorespiration gets localized just to these bundle sheath cells and then there's a final flip towards fully compartmentalized photosynthesis. So what we reasoned then was, OK, we want, let's see if we can make this first step. We need to increase the organelle volume in the bundle sheath cells. So we know nothing about genes that regulate mitochondrial volume. We know nothing about genes that regulate plasma desmata, which is something I forgot to mention. That at this stage here, there's more plasma desmatal connections between these two cell types as well. But we did know something about a gene that regulated chloroplast development. And that went back to work that, again, we'd done many years ago in maize, where we had identified a mutant that had perturbed chloroplast development just in the bundle sheath cells. So this is a picture of the leaf of a golden two mutant, and it's induced by a transposon, a jumping gene. So when the transposon's in the golden two gene, the gene's not functional, and when it jumps out, it is functional. So then you get a green stripe. And if you look in a cross-section of the leaf on that boundary between the revertant sector, where the gene function is restored, and the mutant sector, you can see quite clearly that there's no chloroplasts in the bundle sheath cells in the mutant. So this gene perturbs chloroplast development in maize in the bundle sheath cells when it's mutated, and when it's functional, it regulates the development. So it turns out this gene is required for chloroplast development in all land plants. We showed that it was required in, in mosses, and, but not in algae. And the way it works is that it essentially development and light induce expression of, we call them golden two-like transcription factors. There's normally two genes in each species that we've looked at. The protein gets produced, it's a transcription factor, and it directly binds to the promoters of multiple photosynthetic photosynthesis associated genes. Those proteins get produced and they go to the chloroplast. And then there's a feedback relationship between the chloroplast and the nucleus whereby signals from the chloroplast, when the chloroplast is all happy, come back and switch these genes off. So either switch off the transcription or target the protein for degradation in the proteasome. So knowing this, we thought, well, we can try and just 
turn this gene on everywhere. We won't even just turn it on in the bundle sheet cells. We'll turn it on everywhere and rely on endogenous systems in the rice leaf to turn it over when it's not needed. So we're trying to get chloroplasts bigger in the bundle sheath cells, but the promoters and the switches we have for turning genes on in bundle sheath cells aren't that good. So the, the idea was turn it on everywhere and allow the chloroplasts in the mesophyll cells to turn it back off again. So this is what we did. We used the ubiquitin promoter, which turns genes on everywhere. Here's wild type, here's the transgenic. Here's wild type, here's the transgenic. Wild type, here's the transgenic. So hopefully you can see that we made them darker green. Um, and we happened to delay flowering, so we effectively extended the period in which they photosynthesize. And when we looked at the chloroplast, so here's a bundle sheath cell in a wild type, and here's the transgenic line. And you can see, hopefully, that these chloroplasts are much bigger. Here it is quantified here. So here's the size in a wild type and the mutant. And here's the chloroplast number. So we didn't change the number of chloroplasts, but we changed the size. So every chloroplast that was there was bigger. So that was great. But then here's where the luck came in. Because actually, we changed the mitochondrial number as well. So here's a wild type. This is actually the, a mesotome sheath cell as opposed to a bundle sheath. So here you're just looking at the wild type. Here's that mutant. Here's that big whacking chloroplast. And these are mitochondria. And these are plasma desmata, which when we quantified were also both between the bundle sheath and mesophyll and the bundle sheath and mesotome sheath were significantly increased in our transgenic lines. And when we quantified this against known intermediate species, what you're looking at here is the percentage total chloroplast area and the percentage mitochondrial area in a C3, as in the rice wild type C3, in our transgenic lines and in a protocrans line. And then this is the C2 and the C4. So essentially what we've done is by modifying the activity of a single gene, we had made this switch from C3 to protocrans. So now all we need to do is find the single gene that will do that one and the single gene that will do that one as well. And we're done. <laughs> and with that note, I'm going to finish by just showing you all the people on the team. My flags have gone again. Um, many people started this project off. You can see that it's not a very diverse team. They're predominantly white and they're predominantly male. However, the people who are actually doing the work, the postdocs and the students, have a much more diverse appearance and attitudes and science needs diversity and so these are the team of the future the project is a project for the future i am very honored to be part of it but it will not be finished before i retire this is an intergenerational thing it's very exciting to be part of it can be very frustrating at times um, but it's fun overall so i'll finish there <laughs>